Lima is an incredible city, but it's, it's one of the hardest cities to live in in the world. It has um, very little water available. It has the lowest green space per capita in all of South America. It's the second biggest desert city after Cairo. Um, it has the fastest rate of informal um, development or, or slum community development. And it's a difficult life for people here. We're in a community called Lomas de Zapayal, which is an informal urban settlement in northern Lima. And we are working at a school called the Pythagoras School, which has a secondary and primary school and about 2,000 students. Right now we're standing in um, the Parque Primaria Pythagoras, which is a project we did last year um, uh, with the collaboration of University of Washington, Architects Without Borders, University of San Marcos, and the, the parents and teachers and students of the Pythagoras School. That first year we held these workshops and identified priorities that the parents and the teachers and the students wanted to work on. The first priority was new classrooms for the school, um, second priority was a health post, and the third priority was green spaces. So we got started on, on working on those projects. Um, Coco Alarcón, who's the on-site coordinator and is a Peruvian architect, and I began designing classrooms for the upper school. When we first started working here in 2010, most of the classrooms looked like these and were basically built out of uh, wood paneling with corrugated metal roofs. Very dark inside, poor ventilation, um, during the summer months get very, very hot, so it's hard for students to concentrate inside. And our project, the, the classroom project we're working on, is where the, you see the clear space over there. And we're going to be starting our construction on it on Wednesday. The following year, I started bringing students down here. Um, and we held additional participatory workshops. And based on the outcome of those workshops, we reconfirmed that their, one of their priorities was green space and that they wanted to build a park at the school. Part of our park's design utilizes a hand washing station um, where the majority of the kids at the schools wash their hands. And the water flows from the, the hand washing station through a sand filter where it's cleaned and then down through a series of ceramic pots where it slowly infiltrates into the soil. The clay pot system, which is actually an Incan system um, that was developed hundreds of years ago, um, allows you to grow plants in places you wouldn't think vegetation would grow. The people need something to change the landscape. They live in, in the middle of the desert, so uh, the plants become like a symbol of change. Green spaces provide a huge number of benefits. They improve mental health and, and well-being. They cl clean pollution and dust particles from the air. They provide habitat for animal, insect, and bird species. And they create a, a place for people to gather and, and be together um, in public space, which is really um, an enjoyable atmosphere. For me, as, as more of an ecologist and, a, and an engineer, I think about you know, what does the evidence say about testing these things, and there is some evidence, and there's been many studies in the Netherlands and Spain and even in Peru on people's, how people use green space and how it often reduces their stress and makes them feel more comfortable and more likely to talk to each other. ¿Qué más me gusta? Bueno, lo que me gusta es que, que día a día la arena va desapareciendo y el año pasado eso estaba lleno de arena, le han sembrado plantas y se ve mucho mejor para nuestros hijos, que día a día se va mejorando mejor, ¿no? Gracias a Dios con el apoyo de que tenemos de las, de las personas de afuera, ¿no? El impacto ha sido grande, ¿no? Tanto para los alumnos, profesores y padres de familia, porque era un arenal, ¿no? Sin sentido, sin dimensiones, pero ahora eh, las plantas, eh, la rotonda, y, eh, ha influido muchísimo porque están cuidando, eh, se sienten más alegres, los niños corren alrededor del parque, o sea, su cambio de actitud ha sido fuerte, se sienten más contentos, más alegres, con más ganas de estudiar, de llegar a esta zona que era muy deprimida, muy pobre. 
the parents expressed their, their goals for the park's design um, in a participatory design process. And then the students from UW developed three design options from which the parents picked one. Um, and that initiated the construction of the project, which is the Parque Primaria Pitagoras. And during a two-week period, we had about 300 parents um, who uh, came to work at the school and to construct the park in collaboration with the students who were here. And it, it was an amazing process to, to witness. Two of the things our professors first told us uh, were, one, things never go as expected or according to plan, and two, that things take longer uh, than you think. And every day we realize that it's true. Um, but a day like today where all these parents have come out, uh, it just, it really makes you realize just that you have to be flexible and patient and just, you know, it's the community's project. So we just, we work with them and we let them set the pace. And, and that way it's been the most rewarding and successful. It is, can be very surprising when you actually ask people in a community what it is that they want as opposed to what you think they should want or what they need. And so, and it's very time consuming and it's very frustrating because the building of the trust takes a long time and it's repetitive and it's iterative and sometimes it works and then the next meeting they don't come to. So you have to have a lot of patience and a lot of understanding of the culture to, to make that sort of process work. Between parents, between people, professionals that are working here and the people that from the community is something really important. It's one of the things that more, make more sustainable the project because uh, even if they don't understand too much the project, they have a relationship with you, they consider you your friend, so they think this was built by my friend, so we should take care about that. And I love as much as any architect to build a building and to, to spend uh, all night figuring out the details and iterating different forms. And I, in the one, on the one hand, I think it's, that's an incredibly important process in and of itself, that design process. But if you can marry that with the ideas and aspirations of a community, then I think you have something that's much richer and more beautiful. You have to spend time in the street, you have to listen then very careful. That's how you make a strong relationship with the people, with the community. With Ben and Susan, what's totally different, I don't know uh, how, we, how we start to work, but they're really kind, they're really compressed. We have, uh, at the beginning, we have a language barrier, I think. Uh, but Yes, that's because you talk too fast in Spanish. Yeah, I don't know, but by the time we, we everything becomes easy. We didn't have any big trouble. No, we like each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we laugh a lot. Yeah. It's really taught me a ton about the resilience and the vitality and the incredible lives that the people in this community have and their ability to overcome hardship and to work together to, to build something um, like this school and a better life. Um, so for me, that's, that's what inspires me and keeps me working because I see these, these communities working incredibly hard under very difficult circumstances to, to make better lives for themselves and for their kids. Uy, como mamá, quiero muchas cosas, que ellos lleguen a estudiar y salgan quizás de acá a otro sitio, que se superen más que nosotros que estamos acá y quizás por ellos trabajamos día a día para que sean mejores en el futuro, ¿no?